Okay, so I'm going to talk to you about two research projects, um, uh, both uh, one of which um, these two young women were involved with. Uh, Jennifer, Dr. Jennifer Linden is a scientist at Weill Cornell um, who was a uh, postdoc in my lab and is now an independent investigator. Um, and Paige Winokur was a PhD student in my lab who um, has now graduated and is off to greener pastures, as they say. Um, <laughs> Uh, so I'll talk to you first about this project that uh, Dr. Linden was involved with, uh, or is involved with. This other, this, this concept of measuring what's going on in your brain in real time in a living patient uh, is critical, right? That's, you don't want, want to have to rely on pathology um, for mm -hmm. trying to understand. Plus pathology just gives you a window, a snapshot. Mm -hmm. um, so what Dr. Linden, uh, it, it might sound like I'm being grandiose and that I'm suggesting that we've made a tremendous amount of discoveries that no one else has. But that's only because we really have. We have made a tremendous amount <laughs> of discoveries that no one else has. I, 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 I am not grandiose. These people will tell you that I'm not grandiose. But we, we, these are discoveries that uh, really other people have not pursued um, that we think are really important. One thing that Dr. Linden uh, did that was um, all her and I think uh, really, really innovative and important was she realized that cells shed little vesicles when, they, um, when they're injured. Well, they even shed them when they're not injured, but mm -hmm. when they're injured, they shed more. Um, and in those vesicles is information about the cell um, that shed them. So she can tell you, she's doing work that will enable us to understand things that are going on in the brain by taking a blood sample, which is pretty darn cool. So that costs money. Um, and, you know, she's what we call a scholar at risk because, you know, she needs funding. She's at a critical stage of her career. Um, and that's really, really critical research. That could, that, that's when you ask, um, like, what else is out there? This is an example of something I, for one, think is really, really important but we don't really know how important it is yet, but it, it makes sense that it's gonna to lead to um, kind of pivotal insights. I'll talk to you first about this project that uh, Dr. Linden was involved with, uh, or is involved with, um, and that's about a bacterial toxin um, that, um, that we think drives the formation of new lesions in MS and um, could potentially drive demyelination of the absence of inflammation. People with MS are much more likely to have antibodies to this toxin in their blood than are people who don't have MS. So that's one way you know if you're exposed to a pathogen um, is if you know you're this uh, if you generate antibodies to to it. What is this toxin and where does it come from? So the toxin is called epsilon toxin, and it comes from an organism called Clostridium perfringens, which is a gut microbe. Um, and raise your hand if you've heard about the gut-brain axis or the micro gut microbiome there. Okay, so this is very popular for us now. Um, this organism lives in the gut. Um, uh, substrains of this organism, clustered in perfringens, um, make this toxin epsilon toxin, probably in the small intestine. And when they grow, they make toxin, and the toxin gets into the bloodstream and uh, specifically targets uh, the blood-brain barrier, which is what Dr. Linden proved, uh, and, uh, and opens the blood-brain barrier um, and can enter the brain then and cause injury to, uh, to oligodendrocytes and, and myelin. Can it cause injury to oligodendrocytes and myelin? Yes, uh, that was something else that Dr. Linden showed. Uh, <laughs> remarkably, the targets for this toxin are lymphocytes, blood-brain barrier cells, endothelial cells, and myelin and oligodendrocytes. Uh, ostensibly the three most important cell targets in MS. If, you, if someone said, what are the three most important cells in MS? They'd probably say lymphocytes, oligodendrocytes, and endothelial cells. Um, and that's, those are the specific targets of this toxin. So it became very appealing to us to, uh, to, um, to pursue this. Um, so what we were able to show was that there were people with MS had antibodies to this toxin and people who didn't have MS didn't. The toxin targeted the blood-brain barrier, opened the blood-brain barrier. The toxin 
could target oligodendrocytes, sites, kills oligodendrocytes, sites, causes demyelination, um, and that in the gut microbiome, which is uh, unpublished, um, so I can't go into too much detail about this, we'll just say that in, in the gut microbiome, we find evidence of the organism that makes this toxin in people with MS, but much less commonly in people who don't have MS. Um, so there's a, uh, a package, a story, um, that makes a lot of sense for MS, that has never been done before. Um, a gut microbe, a toxin that explains a lot of the unexplained about, uh, about MS. The other project I want to talk to you about is, um, is what you actually heard when you were invited here, um, uh, which is uh, repurposing drugs. And that's also very, very important. Um, although in a sense, this toxin project, one, both are important. What's nice about the toxin project is that it's upstream, as I told you, of everything else. It's upstream of any other process in MS. So if we can prevent it from its actions, then we can potentially prevent any further progression in the disease or prevent the disease altogether. Um, the other project is about, um, uh, about promoting myelin regeneration. And this is a very complex pro process or uh, uh, prospect. Uh, the, the, why is it complex? Well, it's, we know a lot about oligodendrocytes, the, my, the cells that make myelin. We know a lot about what makes them healthy, what drives myelin formation. But um, when you get into a human or even an animal that has demyelination in the setting of inflammation, in the setting of scarring, scar tissue that forms after there's inflammation, then that prospect of remyelination is much more, more difficult. You should know that remyelination is normal. So we say the brain doesn't regenerate. That's wrong. The brain does regenerate. Um, axons that are severed don't regenerate, at least not typically, um, but myelin regenerates normally. Actually, in most people with MS, up until about age 50, maybe, 45, um, uh, I'm not gonna ask people to raise their hands um, uh, again, uh, 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 remyelination is the rule. Um, remyelination, partial remyelination is very, very common, but at some point it fails. It fails maybe because of age-related factors, but uh, probably it fails because of the cumulative scarring that is going on in the brain with kind of repetitive and relentless uh, inflammation. So identifying, so to, to promote remyelination in an illness, in a context in which you have loss of myelin, but you, the oligodendrocytes are there, which is true in MS, or the a cell that can become an oligodendrocyte is there. Um, one thing you want to do is push that cell along its developmental pathway so that it becomes a myelin forming cell. But you also have to identify all of the molecular targets that are in that lesion that are preventing it from making myelin. Um, and those inhibitors have been understudied. Um, they're studied a lot in the uh, axon regeneration field, but in the myelin regeneration field, they've not been studied nearly enough. Um, so we've identified targets that we think are relevant. Um, we've screened large libraries of compounds um, that, um, that, and identified compounds that target those pathways. Uh, and we've shown that a handful of those drugs um, that are either FDA approved or have gone through a large part of the developmental process for a drug, short of FDA approval, um, that some of those compounds actually will promote remyelination in an animal model. Yes. Tim, could you just maybe talk about the, the, the picture, the strategy for where you are with the research now, where, what the next steps are, um, yeah. and what you think the end point would be, and maybe how long it might take? <clears throat> so for the toxin project, I think the critical, um, the critical, work that needs to get the that needs to get done before a therapeutic can be developed is that we need to show uh, an association with the, um, the the amount of the organism the growth of the organism in the gut and disease activity in the 
Um, so that involves what's called uh, a longitudinal study, studying people with MS and healthy controls over time. Uh, and, uh, and then, um, uh, and then uh, obtaining fecal samples, doing MRIs, uh, obtaining blood and studying, studying all of that um, at regular intervals over time. Uh, and it also needs to be done in different places because um, if when you do a study in one location, you uh, run into a problem of what's called geographic bias. And so you want to do studies like this in multiple locations. So um, we have that study planned. Um, uh, uh, it was, you know, uh, it's a study that we actually submitted to the MS Society. Uh, actually, uh, I, you know, Dr. Linden did a tremendous amount of work. <laughs> she also, um, in collaboration with other groups um, uh, and with other scientists, I, I, Dr. Linden generated a series of antibodies, monoclonal antibodies against the toxin, several of which are neutralized. And so those already are, they're rabbit antibodies or mouse antibodies, but they're already potential therape thera therapeutics. On the myelin regeneration uh, project, uh, I think the, the main obstacle is, is really um, throughput. Uh, uh, taking current drugs that we have, <coughs> screening for new drugs, but taking current drugs that we have um, and screening them in uh, larger numbers of animal models, showing that they promote remyelination. Um, and then uh, if they satisfy that preclinical work, then taking those drugs that have already passed uh, have already been vetted by drug companies and then released. Um, they're, they're from a, a library called the Library of Pharmacologically Active Compounds, which are just drugs that are, um, you know, have already been FDA approved or have gone through what's called toxicology, so we know if they make people sick or not. Um, uh, to uh, uh, take those drugs. Uh, testing a larger number of animals, and then the ones that are most effective that get through all of these different stages, um, to then put those into a um, a phase one or a phase one two study. Uh, I'll say one more thing about that process. Uh, an investigator who's not here, who's made incredible contributions to MS, uh, Susan Gautier. Um, Susan, uh, one of the big problems with Remyelination research is that um, you have to be able to measure myelin mm -hmm. in, the, in a human brain, in a living human, to know if you're promoting remyelination, right? I mean, that's kind of a given. Um, but the techniques that were available yeah. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, were really not specific. Um, uh, at all, and uh, and uh, Susan um, has also a tireless investigator, highly dedicated to MS, and very very innovative. Um, Susan uh, uh, worked with uh, collaborators, physicists, uh, MRI collaborators, to develop a MRI technique um, that is specific for measuring myelin. Another technique that's specific for measuring iron, which is a surrogate marker for inflammation. Um, so she's developed this remarkable um, pipeline of MRI to be able to study remyelination in the human. And, uh, and so that effort um, also needs resources because uh, that effort has to be refined um, and tested and validated in larger studies. So that, that's work that also needs to be validated. But that's really, you, you, you can have all the drugs you want, but if you can't measure what you need to measure, it's worthless. So her work is absolutely critical. They do it in different, they, all of the current drugs for MS target inflammation on some level. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's been really, so now to speak the praises of biotechnology, the biotech industry, uh, the, you know, the first studies uh, done on interferons um, really paved the way. Those were remarkable studies. Um, they showed for the first time that giving a drug on a regular basis could prevent new things from happening, new lesions from forming. 
Um, so that was the handhold or foothold that got the industry interested. It was after those drugs, beta serine, Avonex, and Rebif um, came out that um, biotech then started pouring, you know, millions, billions of dollars into drug development. And then that got us to uh, the next generation of drugs like um, Tecfidera and, um, uh, and Gelenia, and then to the next generation of drugs like Natalizumab, Ticerabri, and Ocrelizumab, Cosempt, all of those drugs. Um, and so each of those has been a, a very, very important innovation. Uh, the, um, the, uh, the, the, you know, the downside is the repetition that I talked about. But uh, yeah, all of the drugs targeted inflammation, that's all they target.